Hello, I'm Benjamin Anthony, founder and director of Our Soldiers Speak and co-founder of the Miriam Institute. And it's my pleasure to host Israel Briefing, where we present to you a series of briefings with some of the most prominent individuals engaged in the security and policy development of the State of Israel. On this episode, we feature Ambassador Pinchas Avivi and Ambassador Arthur Cole, both of whom are former Deputy Directors General of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They are briefing a unique contingent of 40 cadets, all of whom hail from the United States military academies, specifically from West Point Military Academy, the United States Air Force Academy, and Virginia Military Institute. These 40 cadets will all go on to serve as officers in the United States Armed Forces. They traveled to Israel by way of a unique tour that brought them first to Poland for two days, during the course of which they visited the Warsaw Ghetto and also toured Auschwitz and Auschwitz-Birkenau. And from there, they moved on directly to the State of Israel for a 14-day strategy and policy tour that crisscrossed the entire country. In this briefing, we will have the expertise of the two former ambassadors who will speak about Israel's position in the modern geopolitical era. On JBS, here is another in our series, Israel Briefing. I want to talk about, uh, with you about a new situation in the world, about a change that is uh, more or less in the last 10 years that completely put us in a situation that we as a diplomat for the first time 10 years ago understood that everything that we learned about international relations doesn't have any value. We have to study everything from the beginning. What happened? What was before? What is going on today? What is so important for you and for us uh, to understand? The world that we were used to, uh, to know before was divided in a very special way, two different ways. First of all, between the Soviet Union on one side and the United States and the West from the other side. Funny, but uh, in the right side was the left side of the world. In the left side was the right side of the world, from the political point of view. The Middle East was in that time precisely on the border between the Soviet Union and the Western world. The Middle East was super important for Russia, first of all because they needed, always needed, a way for hot water. Russia is surrounded by ice from uh, most of the places. And in order to go to the ocean, to be sure that they can defend themselves in a world war, they needed the way from Russia through the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, and from the Mediterranean to the channel of Suez, and from Suez to, Okia, to the uh, Indian Ocean. So it was the most strategic point for the, for the Russian to defend and to be in the Middle East. For the United States, there was two good reasons why the Middle East was so important. First of all, if it is so important for the Russia, the only way to avoid them from freedom on the, on the sea, is to, to be there and to defend the way. But not less important was that they depended men, during many, many years on the energy that came from especially Arab states, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries. And in order to defend their interest in the international uh, uh, energy world, they needed to be in the Middle East. And we found ourselves, Israel, Precisely on the border, from one side, uh, from uh, between uh, Soviet Union and the uh, United States, but also in another border, not less important, because the world was not only di uh, divided between left and right, was divided also between north and south. If you are looking at the map, all the northern country are the developed country. All the, say, the countries in the south. All of them, all over the world, are from the third world. Right? Somehow, Israel was precisely on the border between north and south, between left and right, and we understood that we have to prepare ourselves for a situation in which there is a conflict between right and left, and for the continuous uh, problem between north and south. 
What happened 10 years ago? What put us in a situation that I understood that everything that we knew before has no value anymore? I will begin with an anecdote that will explain somehow what happened 10 years ago. My friend, Arthur Cole, was also a student, but also a professor later on. It's a national college for, uh, for uh, uh, security, a place where young general and important diplomats are studying together, trying to understand the problem of the world, the problem of Israel, our situation in the international world. In order to understand the situation, normally they are used to prepare some kind of uh, a game or simu simulation of situation in which we, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, are asked to prepare some kind of an exercise, simulation of situation, that will put the situation a little bit more difficult for the, for the situation itself, in order that they will compete with a difficult situation. So let's think that 10 years ago, I was asked by the college to prepare simulation of situation. And in order to make it interesting, to find some important thing, I would begin by saying that today, some kind of uh, tsunami was in Japan, and in one night, the world lost more than 300 billion of dollars. But it's not important enough, it's important. But how come it will be important to Israel? So in order to make it more important, more interesting, I will tell them that somebody, for example, in, uh, in uh, North Africa, went to the, to the central uh, uh, park of the city and burned himself. As a result of that, millions of people come to the square as though a beginning of some kind of revolution. Okay? But it's not important enough yet, so I will tell them that immediately after Tunisia, that was the first place in my exercise, in Egypt and in Bahrain and in Yemen and other places, people are going to the square. And there's some kind of a new evolution. But if it's not enough to make it interesting, I will tell them that in the same uh, time, more or less, some kind of uh, war, internal war, is beginning in Syria. In order to make it much more interesting, I will tell them that parallel to all that kind of process, a country named Iran is preferring themselves to be in a, a country that will not only export the revolution to the rest of the world, but trying to be a nuclear state. If it's not important enough, interesting enough, I will put in the exercise as well that precisely at the same time, the kind of immigration from North Africa and from, as a result of the process also uh, from the uh, Middle East to Europe, that might change the face of, uh, of uh, Europe forever. Believe me, if 10 years ago and one month I was preparing that kind of exercise for the college, they would send me to some kind of an hospital. <laughs> so Mr. Aviv is absolutely out of the way. But this happened. Everything that I say happened precisely at the same time. You remember the beginning of what we called, or finally called, the Arab Spring, the immigration to Europe, the tsunami in Japan, the internal war or the civil war in Syria, the fact that the Iran is beginning to prepare itself to be a nuclear state, all that happened at the same time. And from that moment, the war between West and, the, and, the, and East, and the war between North and South are not any more important. They are absolutely, completely different pressures in the, in the situation. I remember in the first day of the uh, what called so-called Arab Spring, I was invited uh, to a meeting in the United States in Washington in the National Security Council, and I was asked by, by the professor who was leading the meeting to speak about But he began, and he said, wow, what wonderful thing is happening. People that come from the Facebook are now in the square. We are maybe in the beginning of some kind of democracy, liberalism, it changes in the world. People from Facebook, people from the internet, wow, what a nice process Arab Spring began. I very seriously took a look at him and said, Professor, I'm so sorry. I'm looking at the same picture, but I'm seeing something absolutely different. That's Mr. Avini. Don't you see the people in the square? Yes, I see. 
Don't you know that they came from the Facebook? Yes, I know. Don't you know that they are Libra? Yes, I know. So what is so different between what you think and, and, and I think? Told him, yes. I'm trying to see the same picture a little bit more seriously. And I'm looking into the square. I don't see anybody like, for, exa for example, uh, Robespierre in the square or Che Guevara in the square. Some kind of a leader that leads these young people from the Facebook to the kind of revolution that you are speaking about. More than that, if you're asking me what is the reason they came to square, they didn't come to the square in order to change the world to liberal, democratic, free world. The person who burned himself in the center of the, the uh, square did it only for one reason. He lost his job. He knew that he has to bring food to his home. He will not be able to do it anymore. And one million more people who see themselves in the same situation are coming to the square for the same reason. They are not fighting for freedom. They are fighting for food. Sustainability, we say. This is the word that is more important to understand. Sustainability is the name of the game. But when I'm looking more seriously to the square, square, I see another two things very important. In the square, in one side, I can see the officer from the old regime, and from the other side, I can see the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood. If and you ask me, Professor, the war will not be between, be, be between the people who are in the square and the government, but between two options. Who will win the war between themselves? Will it be the people officer from the old government or the new kind of uh, Islamic uh, brotherhood that will try to replace them? And if you will ask me another question, Professor, if you will ask me what will happen, I, told, I will tell you that we, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, believe that it doesn't matter who will win the first war. A year after, he will fall. Because nobody has a solution for the problem of sustainability of the people who are in the square. As unless the world will see the problem seriously. Unless the world will be able to solve the problem where it happened. They will find themselves in Europe. They will find themselves in, in the United States. And they will change the face of uh, the world. So the first thing that we understood was a new process that a war without arm of people who are coming to the square can change the situation in many, many different countries and uh, change it in a way that will force the world to behave themselves in a very different way. This is the first problem. And if I want, I could talk about that and if you'll ask me, I will tell you why they are not able to solve the problem if you will ask me the question. But I'm, I was asked to, to speak more than 20 minutes, so I'll pass to the other thing. As a result of the war in, in or the Arab Spring, one of the first and most important results was uh, what happened in Syria. You will know that in Syria in the last uh, 10 years, something like 500,000 people died in a civil war inside. And we know as well that at the same time, uh, Iran, Syria, uh, Iran, Turkey, and uh, Russia, especially Russia, are very much involved with what's happening today in uh, Syria. And one of the first questions is, how come Russia is involved, Iran is involved, Turkey is involved, and we don't see the United States. And I have to tell you, without entering into too many details, what seriously happened that for the United States, Middle East is less important today because the war, the Cold War with uh, Russia ended, and the need for energy for Middle East ended as well when they found a lot of energy in the coast of uh, United, uh, United States itself. So we found out that, first of all, in the first time, for Israel especially, for Middle Eastern uh, country as well, in a situation that who is seriously leading the situation is not United States anymore, but Russia. And if Russia is now leading a new situation, means for us in Israel that we need very seriously to find a way somehow to coordinate our policy, not only with the United States, the best friend of Israel, the only and the one important friend of Israel, but somehow to find a way also to coordinate our uh, policy with also with uh, Russia. And we found a way, 
And somehow, I believe, eight or seven years ago, we, for the first time, put as a target for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as the first uh, important uh, policy of, uh, of Israel, to find a way to coordinate our interest with Russia itself. It was very easy, because our diplomat in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs understood that many, many of the interests of uh, the Russian today, differently from the past, from the Soviet Union time, are going together with the policy of Israel. And did, we did a very special uh, work in order to find the way uh, to talk and to coordinate our policy with, uh, with uh, Russia. We did it for the first time in a very interesting moment. So in a moment that uh, uh, NATO decided that they want uh, to put uh, into NATO in the future, in the next future, Ukraine and Georgia. And we understood that if they want to put Georgia and Ukraine in the NATO, not immediately, but tomorrow morning, Russia will do everything in order to avoid it. How can they avoid it? By finding a way to enter in a war or in a conflict in Ukraine and in Georgia and the win bases that they didn't have before in order to avoid the possibility of the West to enter into the game. When we understood it, first of all in Georgia, before the war in Georgia, we decided that we are not ready to sell to, sell to Georgia arms that are strategic arms that can put a situation that Israeli strategic arm will be in the hand of Georgia in a war with Russia. Because the answer immediately will be against Israel in other parts of the world. And we gave an order in our, my ministry, at that time I was in charge of it, not to sign any new agreement with Georgia on strategic arms to attack, to give them everything to defend. It's okay. They have the right to defend themselves, but not an attack. Somehow the Israeli companies went uh, to ask how come the ministry is uh, avoiding agreement in billions of dollars. And it appeared in the newspaper. Somehow it appeared in the newspaper all over the world the day that the war between Georgia and Russia began. And for the first time, Russia understood that Israel is not willing to enter in serious conflict against them and trying to avoid a situation that Israeli arm will be against them. The answer was that immediately, as a result, because they were seriously grateful, they cancelled the important agreement that they had with Iran, selling arms to Iran that would avoid the possibility of the West and Israel itself, if it's needed, to attack them. From that moment, there were many other things, but from that moment, we found ourselves for the first time with some kind of understanding between Russia and Israel. Everything was done with the American knowing about every step. America remained the most important alliance of Israel. But as a result of it, we found ourselves in a new situation with Russia. At the same time, I told you, a war began in, in Syria. And we had to take decision what we are doing in the, in the war. And we decided about three red lines that will lead Israel's policy in, uh, in uh, Syria. The first one, we will not permit a, a chemical weapon and biological weapon that the Syrian has to be used by them or by somebody else in Syria. Thanks God it was an agreement, it was the count of failure. The second thing, we will avoid seriously any movement of arms from uh, uh, Syria or Iran into the hand of uh, the, the Hezbollah or other. From time to time you are hearing, including yesterday, the day before, that when something happened and somebody is trying to move arms to the, to the uh, Hezbollah or other forces, somebody is attacking them and avoiding the process to happen. And the last thing that we decided is uh, that we will not permit Hezbollah to be in the northern border of Israel from Syria as well. And if something happened, we will be immediately involved to avoid it. And again, from time to time you're hearing that when Hezbollah is being, coming a little bit to the border, we are doing everything to avoid them. Last thing that I want to talk only because the time is going to finish is some kind of an agreement that we found ourselves as difficult to understand between Iran, Turkey, and, uh, and uh, Russia. 
three entities that 100% different one from another. Russia is a civil country against Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalism. Turkey is a Sunni, fun not fundamentalistic, but brotherhood, uh, Islamic brotherhood state. And Iran is a Shia state that is 100% against Sunna and, and against the other uh, not uh, Shia countries as well. How come? There is an agreement between themselves. Well, I, I say always, it's not an agreement, it's an understanding. When Russia wanted to use uh, Iran, head for the Sunni fundamentalism group, as a proxy for its interest, nothing is more dangerous from, uh, to Russia as well today for the possibility of uh, Sunni fundamentalistic groups that are preparing themselves for some kind of revolution from Syria. <coughs> well, they believed that Iran can uh, support them in that uh, part of the war. But they didn't want uh, Iran to stay in Syria. They didn't want Iran to build bases in Syria. So now you will understand that while you find yourself from time to time, yesterday, the day before yesterday, that Israel is attacking Iranian bases in Syria, Russia is looking and doing nothing to avoid it. Because they want to use Iran for the interest. They don't want to help them to build a basis or a bridge between Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and the Mediterranean. It's against the Russian interest. Turkey is very much interested in the northern part of Syria, especially if they are scared from the situation, the Kurds in the northern part of uh, Syria will put in danger the stability of Turkey. So if they can use Russia, and if they can use Iran to avoid the possibility of uh, to avoid the possibility of the Kurds to become uh, stronger, they will do everything for that. But in that point, the agreement between the countries is completely uh, finished. There is no real agreement. It's a practical uh, interest that they are working together, and they completely separate themselves one from another when that interest is solved or somehow is uh, on, uh, not anymore on the table. Last thing that I want to tell you, one of the questions that uh, everybody asks me, especially in, uh, in the international arena, how come that uh, uh, Russia is not doing anything to avoid Iran from becoming a nuclear state? So I would say it's only three words. I will explain more if you will ask me. Russia don't want Iran to become a nuclear state. But Russia is not so much afraid of it. Three or four nuclear bombs in the end of, of uh, Iran. If you are looking for the uh, quantity of uh, bombs that, uh, Soviet, the, that uh, Russia has, it's not a danger. At the same time, they don't want to avoid it completely because if they will solve the problem in Iran and the, the government in Iran will fall, not the Russian, but the American will enter. So they are trying very seriously to keep the, the fire as low as possible, not to burn their hand from one side, not to permit Iran to become stronger more than they want to, but not to permit Americans to come back. That's more or less the situation that we are dealing with today. Uh, am I optimistic about the rest? We will talk about uh, after how to call, because I will tell you what, I will tell you what, what are the possibilities. But I can tell you one thing. Thanks God today. From the security point of view, we are stronger than ever. So we are not afraid from the situation, but we are concerned. We are doing everything to keep it as low as possible and to be sure that we can defend ourselves. Thank you. I understand that on your way here, you stopped for two days in Poland and went to the camps. Um, that wasn't part of my planned uh, comments, but uh, I think that uh, you being there is more significant individually and uh, for the program that you are in. And I assume that uh, it is a life-changing experience uh, that will accompany you for many, many years. It definitely well for understandable reasons. Uh, that was the case with me. When I visited uh, the camps, uh, being second generation of Holocaust survivors, my mother is a survivor of uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, and I will never forget uh, 
both visits that I had there once uh, when I went there with the College for National Security where I was an instructor there uh, with uh, high level officials uh, and that was my first encounter there. And second time when I went with my wife and children um, for a much more private uh, visit. And uh, so for you to be there and uh, come from there to Israel, uh, I'm sure it is uh, very significant. That was just an opening comment connected to your program. I will try to be short, even though I already took two minutes of my time, <laughs> to allow um, more time for questions. I, I'm totally in agreement with uh, Ambassador Avivi, so um, I will um, hopefully make my comments short. Let me say that I, I, I start with a few observations about where the world is right now, in my view. Uh, number one, we are witnessing uh, an uh, immensely important uh, development, fairly new, and that is uh, the trade war that is going on between the United States and China. Uh, it is uh, theoretically only about uh, trade and uh, economic uh, ad advances. In my view, it is much more than that. Uh, we are uh, seeing, not only through the trade war, but also limitations about uh, technology import and export, um, a peak in what is the fight for world hegemony between the two important powers, which are, of course, the United States and the upcoming China. Uh, China of today is not China of 30, 40, 20, or even 10 years ago. It is dominant. It is not hiding its ambitions. It is doing so through immense investment, purchase of technology, in-house development of supreme technology, and that is the name of the game today. And I think at this point what we are witnessing is uh, much more than just a trade war, but a, a war uh, about uh, world hege hegemony. Second uh, thing that is uh, very evident, that in the West, or much of the West, not all of the West, uh, we are uh, seeing a conservative right-wing uh, leaderships in power, both in the United States, in much of Europe. And we also see that in Brazil. Uh, this is something that is too early to see whether it is a long-term development or just the regular pendulum that is swinging once to the left and once to the right, as is the case in democracies change of power, change of ideolo ideology, but the pendulum swings. Uh, but definitely in Europe, we see the rise of uh, uh, conservatism, nationalism, um, the idea of one big Europe united is shaking. I'm not only talking about Brexit. Uh, Britain is on its way out. I'm talking about what is happening within the remaining states which are make, uh, uh, making uh, the European Union, particularly in the eastern part of, uh, of the Union, Poland, Hungary, but also other countries, and, and even uh, in the big countries, uh, France, uh, definitely Germany, we see strong elements of national uh, uh, powers strengthening. So th things are happening there, partly 
in response to the wave of uh, immigration that took place and is still taking place uh, um, from the Middle East, from Afghanistan, from the, and, and of course Africa and North Africa. But other are ideological Im influences of other streams and forces. Third thing which I want to highlight is the fact that the world is not moving in a linear, uh, lin uh, in a linear line. Ambassador uh, Avivi talked about the dramatic changes that could not have been foreseen ahead of time that did take place in the last 10, 20 years. That's how the world uh, is operating. You plan, we, we have a saying in Hebrew, uh, we humans are planning and God laughs. Uh, we can plan, but uh, we know one thing, that all that we plan is uh, going to be uh, a victim to the changes that are going to, do, uh, to take place. And you have to plan for, for surprises. It's difficult to plan for surprises, but you have to put that into the equation. Not so many years ago, when uh, President Bush II was in power, neoconservatism was uh, very much the ideological background of, uh, which dominated the way the United States operated globally. In short, what it meant is that the idea was that what needs to be done in all ways possible is to ensure that democracy prevails as in, uh, and spreads. Liberal uh, democracy uh, is spreading because democracies don't fight each other. And if we want to ensure global peace, that can be achieved only by the spread of democracy. If you look today at the American policy of Donald Trump, neoconservatism cannot be further away from the ideology uh, at present than uh, with Donald Trump, who is engaged with North Korea, or wants to be engaged with North Korea, but does not ask for change of regime, only of policy. The United States is acting against Iran but cl clarifying that it wants to say, see same, uh, change in policy, but not asking for change of power, of regime in Iran. It can live with the uh, present regime as long as there is a change of policy, particularly regarding the nuclear issue and spread of terrorism. And, and uh, even in a place which is Venezuela, uh, Regretfully, in my view, the United States has, has failed so far in uh, seizing the opportunity of seeing a change of power, the opportunity given by the uprising of many of the people in Venezuela. What it means for Israel is that uh, we have to understand that the world is changing that changes are very quick, and we have to be able, as a small country, in uh, the sea surrounded by a hostile, uh, in, a, in a hostile neighborhood, we have to be able to, to swim in this uh, uh, dangerous, stormy sea in, a, in ways which uh, no, we, we cannot allow uh, mistakes in reading the situation. Um, that put aside, it is just uh, you know opening for you to ask questions uh, if you wish later on. Closer to home, the Palestinian issue. Uh, it is, uh, I'm sure, you notice that it is not much on the news. Uh, you are young, but there were times, believe me, that it was very high on the agenda of global. Uh, diplomacy of international media and so on, depending on the events on the ground here. 
and it seems that it is pretty much in uh, uh, dormant. Uh, at time from, uh, from time to time, there is an, a violent uh, eruption uh, along the border with Gaza. We deal with it. Maybe for a few days, it's on the news. And then it's dormant again. But the fact of the matter is that uh, it is not going away. Israel will have to deal with the issue. There is Gaza with close to 2 million people living there, suffering under the control of a terror organization. They cannot or will, or will not or do not wish, doesn't matter, to uh, topple uh, Hamas from, uh, from the rule. We have uh, the West Bank with a significant Palestinian population. Uh, which is under uh, Israeli control, asking you know, for a solution. And we are, uh, let's put it uh, bluntly, we both, we and the Palestinians, are incapable of bringing a long-term solution to the problem. It is not violent at the moment. Actually, if you go to the West Bank, you will see uh, an economic boom compared to where it was uh, before. If you go to Ramallah and other uh, Palestinian cities, you will not be able to compare because you haven't been there before, but really uh, an economic boom, which keeps the situation more quiet. The motivation for violence is, is, is not high, but doesn't uh, disappear. And in any case, we have to solve the problem. The previous administration, uh, Donald Trump, um, uh, Obama and Secretary Kerry uh, tried to come up with a, a kind of a solution to bring the two parties to a dialogue, failed, and actually since then there is no engagement. Zero engagement. I mean, we are next to each other, there is uh, even cooperation on security matters between our uh, security and the, uh, and the Palestinian Authority security. But when it comes to long-term solution, no engagement. Uh, Donald Trump uh, came to power, and from day one, he said that he would like to try and uh, produce that magic solution, which he calls the deal of the century, and uh, has worked uh, for quite some time to shape that deal, and uh, we are in the midst of uh, the effort to make it public. And it is not made public uh, mainly because uh, in Israel we have a political turmoil. Elections and new elections, and this is not a time to come up with major solutions because there is nobody to deal with. Um, if I may say at least my, my opinion, uh, the, deal of the century as it is being shaped by the Trump administration will turn out to be as a non-starter. It will be a non-starter uh, because um, uh, it puts forward the economic dimension before the political solution is uh, not only agreed upon but even understood. Now, I, there is logic in trying to produce a mega economic program, a Marshall Plan for uh, the Palestinians that will uh, inject huge investments, funds, into the Palestinian econ economy, boost it, and then the motivation for a political solution will uh, hopefully uh, uh, be increased. The only problem is that the Palestinians are not in that game. And because the Palestinians are not in the game, because they want to see, they want to see the, end, the end game of this. OK, we are all in favor of uh, an economic uh, injection. That is, of course, to our benefit. But where will it lead us? If it is not clear where it will lead us, or there is a huge concern about where it will lead us, they are not game. In addition to the fact that the Palestinian Authority leadership, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu, is extremely weak. Uh, he, the leader of the Palestinian Authority is uh, not very healthy, 
80 something year old. How old is he? 82. 82. Not very healthy, politically weak, not in a situation to take dramatic uh, historic decisions for his people. And because the Palestinians are not game, regretfully, the Arab world that can be or should be partners to such a major effort are at best hesitating, at worst stating clearly that they are not game uh, either. Not because they do not want to see that, but because they say we are in only if the Palestinians are in. And if the Palestinians are not in the game, we are not. So I, I do not have high expectations of the deal of the century. Uh, something different will have to develop sometime. Ambassador Avivi talked about Syria, Iran, Russia, Turkey, our northern uh, border in general. Here I would say the following. One, both the United States and Israel have um, failed in reading or uh, understanding where things can go when the civil war in Syria started. We did not react properly to the civil war um, for different reasons. Um, the United States did not want to be involved in another war. It had enough with Afghanistan and with Iraq. And then uh, uh, President Trump, when he was elected, he was elected partly uh, on the premise of disengaging from co conflict areas. Ambassador Avivi also explained that the Middle East is less important than it used to before the uh, United States. It is now not only an importer of uh, oil, but uh, an exporter. And. Uh, uh, therefore, the Americans did not want to see themselves involved in the Syrian situation. In Israel, we saw two evils. You know, Assad is definitely not a friend, but uh, Daesh, ISIS, not the best alternative. So, you know, this, uh, I, not, I put it in a very simple way to see two such mega enemies fighting each other and killing each other is not too bad, as long as you don't, you don't get involved in it. So Israel made every effort not to get involved in it. Let's not forget that in the beginning there were predictions globally that Assad eventually will fall, which is not too bad. The question is what comes instead. But he did not. With the help of Iran, Hezbollah, Russia, Assad prevailed. Not only that Assad prevailed, but the, those who helped him survive want to cash in. You know, we, we made sure that you are still in power. Now it's time, it's time to pay. So Russia got what it wanted and improved major naval port in Syria for the reason that Ambassador Avivi talked about the importance of naval presence in the Mediterranean. It got it. A major air force base in Syria. It got it. It's happy. Turkey wants to prevent a, a strengthening of the Kurds in Syria. It uh, more or less got it. And Iran wants to have ground contiguity con uh, between Iran through Iraq, Syria, to the Mediterranean. For us, and it's an impossible uh, reality. We cannot allow Iran to be present on our border in Syria. It is already present on our border in Lebanon with the Hezbollah. But that is a major issue, but somehow we can deal with. But to have Iran proper building a military presence in Syria on our border 
is, is an unacceptable development. Because that, uh, uh, we, we do not have uh, an equal situation here. It means that Iran has a border with Israel. Israel has no border with Iran. For Israel, Iran is far away. For, for Iran, it is knocking on our door. This is something, if you add to it the ambition to develop nuclear capabilities and so on, this is our major strategic threat. I will um, end by saying the fo uh, following. I think that globally, even, th even though you don't see things, conflicts erupting, there is a lot of volatility. North Korea, it seems that the dialogue collapsed. Iran is under immense pressure by the United States, but the Iranian regime will respond. It, already, it has already responded, you know, with the four tankers and, uh, and, and so on. It has responded, it will respond, because the regime wants to survive. Uh, in our region, you have the Hamas, the Hezbollah, Iran in Syria, According to international media, only in the last week, three times Israel uh, responded um, or acted militarily in Syria, including against Iranian uh, attempts to bring in additional rockets to the, uh, and strengthening its presence there. Situation is volatile. If it erupts in our region, it can be small, with Hamas, it can be on one front from, uh, for Israel, and it can deal with it relatively easily. It can be with Hezbollah, a much more serious threat. Well over 100,000 rockets of all ranges with increasing accuracy. And of course, Syria situation can uh, add to that. Israel can deal with it, but it will be extremely costly and the, if there is a conflict, it will be totally different than anything we have seen before. We will see Israeli civilian population suffer, targeted and suffering immensely, including strategic uh, installations in the country which will be hit. Israel will respond with immense power as well. And the, the war, if it erupts, will be totally different than we have known before. It will look like much more Star Wars than anything else with rockets, long, uh, long, uh, long range um, uh, rockets being fired, anti-rocket arms being uh, fired in response. It will be Star Wars with technology, uh, uh, unlike anything else that we have seen before. Not a rosy situation. We hope to be able to avoid it, but the danger, the risks have risen significantly. So with that, I'll open it to the questions. So how does Israel navigate this relationship? It has new friends um, and new allies, and how does Israel go about strengthening this relationship without um, upsetting the popular opinion in the countries um, that surround Israel? Okay, very interesting question. I want to tell you something. I participated personally in the peace talks between Israel and Palestinian during the years. And I remember that uh, when we talked yet, it, I'm talking about more than 30 years ago, with Arafat, and to try to achieve an agreement with him, one of the subjects that was on the table, that he always told us that he's not able to go too much uh, uh, toward Israel because he has the opposition of all Arab states. And as you said, during the last year, there is a serious uh, change in the philosophy of the Arab state. For the first time, we found ourselves in a situation that Arab states are much more supporting an agreement according to what Israel wants than the Palestinian. And the Palestinians are finding, finding themselves completely isolated, not only from Israel, for in their side, uh, in view, but also from our world. What happened? What happened is very important uh, movement, not between us and the Palestinians, but between the Gulf countries and Iran. It's the moment that the Gulf countries understood that a nuclear bomb in the hand of Iran is a danger directly for them, much more than it will be against Israel, because the Iranian believes that Israel may answer with 
the same kind of arm against them, if they will act against uh, Israel. They see in Israel not an enemy, but opportunity. If they want to defend themselves from Iran, they need some, some kind of coordination uh, between us and the Arab state against Iran to avoid a war, a war in the Middle East. In that situation, for the first time, they are not so much interested. They want, yes, they want an agreement between us and the Palestinians, but they don't want to put it in the first place. The cooperation with us is much more important, including the fact that the United States is not so much interested anymore in the energy for our state, makes them understand that the door to the United States is going through Israel. So our allies is a relation between Arab state and the United States. We are an allies in the war against fundamentalistic Shia, Shia war between Middle East and Iran. And I want to remind you that if you are talking about conflict much bigger than the conflict between Zionism and Islam, or Christianism and Islam, is a war, a war between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. And the Arab states that are Sunni, together with Israel, defending themselves for the same uh, problem. That puts us in a situation that for the first time, not only from the security point of view, but also from the economic point of view, there are a lot, a lot of bridges that are built between Arab state and Israel, and the future is only a dream. What can happen? I, will, uh, I agree with everything. I would just say that there is a difference between what goes on under the table and what is open to the public. Uh, under the table, and sometimes even deeper under the carpet if you want, uh, there are engagements between Israel and many of the uh, Arab states uh, from Saudi Arabia uh, and the rest of the Gulf states and uh, other Arab countries, Sunni Arab countries, for the reasons that Ambassador Abebe uh, has elaborated on. There is a difference, however, however, between that and them going public. You know, um, they, they, they avoid that. Uh, they are not uh, willing to engage in uh, serious, o uh, open, uh, diplomatic discussion, let alone establishment of official diplomatic ties with Israel. For that to happen, a major breakthrough between us and the Palestinians ha has to take place. Before that, no open diplomatic ties. Cooperation against the mega enemy, Iran, absolutely. Including sharing of intelligence, absolutely. Economic uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and trade, as long as it, uh, you take out the label made in Israel, go ahead. In some cases, even you can leave the made in Israel label in some places. But going open is a long way from where we are. They would like to see a breakthrough between us and the Palestinians. They cannot impose it naturally. Not on us, but not even the Palestinians. So we are making the best of that reality. I think that Israel is conducting a very sophisticated uh, uh, game with the uh, Arab uh, countries and is achieving the best that can be achieved in the absence of a breakthrough with the Palestinians. Thank you very much. And um, the next question that uh, you both touched upon is Russia's very important and significant involvement in our neighborhood. It is in Syria to stay. It has uh, access to a port for uh, dozens of years into the future. It has air bases and it's not planning on leaving Syria anytime soon. And I think that both people in Israel and abroad are trying to understand um, Israel's relationship with Russia, its true relationship, the essence of this relationship. Um, can Israel recruit Russia to the mission of kicking Iran out of Syria? Can this be done? Or is the opposite the case? Is Russia's presence enabling 
uh, Iran to stay in Syria, to be active and to threaten Israel from Syria. Um, what can Israel do? What are its options? As I tried to explain in uh, the briefing, there is uh, some kind of uh, conflict between Iran and Syria. Syria uh, Ra Russia. Russia wants very much to use Iran as a proxy in its war against the Islamic Sunni fundamentalistic group. I want to give you two numbers to understand why it's so important to Russia. 20% of uh, the Russian population is Islamic, but 40% of the young people who are going to military service are Islamic. Meaning that the fact that in some years, I don't know, in uh, 20 or 25 years, could happen that the majority of the people in Russia will be Islamic. And somehow they are very much scared, especially after Ch Chechnya, from the possibility that they will come back to the war, uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalistic war, against them. So they are trying to use the Shia uh, Iranic group to fight against Sunnah uh, fundamentalistic group. But I don't believe that they want them to stay in, in, uh, in uh, Syria for the simple reason. When we explain, and you explain, why it's so much uh, dangerous for us, the bridge between Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, and it's very dangerous for Israel, believe me, it looks less dangerous for Russia itself. If they want to, uh, to defend their uh, bases on the Mediterranean, in the northern part of Syria, in the Krim Island, they don't want Iran to be there. That's why we can see that while they are working together in fighting against fundamentalistic Islam group, I believe, I seriously believe, and I heard it from the Russians as well, they don't want the Iranian to build the bases in the, uh, Syria itself. To participate, yes. To stay there, no. By the way, I didn't mention it before, but the possibility of Iranian bases in uh, Syria is not only a danger for Russia and for Israel, it's not less a uh, danger for uh, two kids as well. There is a serious fight between fundamentalistic Shia and Islamic uh, uh, Sunni groups. And to have the Iranian not on the eastern border of uh, Turkey, but also in the uh, southern border, is a serious danger for uh, Turkey. So not Turkey, not Israel, not Russia, want Iran to stay uh, in uh, uh, Syria, in my opinion. I, I agree, yet I am, I'm left with a question mark. If that is the case, why doesn't Russia come and tell uh, Iran, okay, enough is enough. We are finished, we are finished with the war. You can have uh, economic advances. Of course, you invested a lot of money and uh, also blood in uh, the survival of Assad. So benefit from it, uh, uh, from our victory economically and uh, otherwise. But stop building your uh, military presence in Syria. It doesn't do that. So um, I'm left with that uh, question mark. On the other hand, once the Russians ensured that Assad is in power, and that is now not in question. <coughs> it is now con uh, consolidating its reconquer of, it, of the country, uh, Assad. Uh, what Russia wants is stability. It got all it wanted to get from the war. It already increased its military presence and uh, commitment of, uh, of Syria and Syrian regime to Russia for the long run. It has achieved its uh, goals. Now, what Russia wants is stability. Iran and its uh, military buildup in Syria is a threat to stability. Because Israel, as I explained earlier, will not be able to sit idle. And the conflict is everything other than stability. So therefore, we see a change in uh, the Russian attitude towards much of the Israeli declared and non-declared war against Iran in Syria, and less and less statements condemning uh, Israeli activity, including this week. Nothing was said. Russia said quietly, said nothing, uh, as long as it doesn't threaten its military uh, bases 
uh, activity in northern uh, Syria, it actually wants to see the Iranians limited, hopefully one day even out uh, of Syria because it fits its interest of stability once it achieved its goals. And then one more question before we open it up to the floor, and that is um, the problematic triangle that exists in relations between Israel, uh, China, and the United States. Of course, the United States is Israel's top, most important strategic ally, and yet China, um, people have described the 21st century as the century of China. China is growing, uh, its economic uh, power it's grow is growing, its presence is growing. Israel has allowed um, Chinese companies, state companies, to build uh, a port um, and to manage another port, and this has um, upset uh, the uh, American administration. How can Israel navigate this minefield? How can it cultivate relationships uh, with China without upsetting uh, our most important ally. You, you touched uh, a very important issue. I will start by saying that Israel, being a small country, from day, from day one, or actually even before it was established, but definitely since it uh, uh, gained independence in 1948, Israel set a major strategic goal for its long-term stabil survival, stability, well-being, and that is we have to have a major power as a very close ally. We cannot deal with the threats in the region without a major ally. And for many reasons, ideological and practical, uh, and simply uh, similar ways of uh, ethos and, and ways of thinking, it is the United States. It goes both ways. America is our major ally, has been, and will continue to be. On the other hand, the world is changing. And China is a growing power, and its economic uh, significance is immense. It's a huge market. It is a huge market for the United States. It is a huge market for everyone. Uh, as I said earlier, the Chinese are in the midst of a major attempt to increase its influence in the world through investment, and the ports here are only one example, but it is specifically signaled ports uh, all around the West, in Africa, in Europe, in Latin America, uh, as areas where they um, spread their influence through. It invests in technology. Israel, so far, has limited the number of Israeli companies being purchased by Chinese due to understanding that uh, it will not be good to our national security as well as our ties with the United States. Just one example, there is a major insurance company that a Chinese company wanted to purchase a few years ago, and the Israeli regulator did not approve it. Because if you have this insurance company, major insurance company, in Chinese hands, you have all the information that is in the hands of the insurance company, in the hands of the Chinese. Uh, Israel wants to see Chinese uh, investment in the flourishing high-tech uh, sector, but it has to be very careful as to what kind of uh, technology it is uh, willing to share with the uh, Chinese and which not. This is a matter of concern now, growing concern for the United States, as we have seen, with uh, uh, Huawei and, uh, and other uh, technologies. And the Americans are making it clear that we have to be attentive to the American concerns. And I think that we will, because uh, in the end, the overwhelming um, priority for Israel will always be, in such cases, the continuing partnership with the United States, even if it means sometimes limiting economic opportunities vis-a-vis -vis China.
We welcome your questions. We'll try and get in as many as we can. So, yeah, go ahead, please. How is Israel balancing working with Sunni countries while fighting and containing Wahhabism, which is also really dangerous to the region? It's very easy to answer because we are not against Islam. We're against fundamentalism. Personally, I'm against fundamentalism, Christian, Jewish, and Islamic at the same time. I think the same problem for us uh, with the fundamentalistic Islam is precisely today the same problem for our countries as well. If in the past, for example, Saudi Arabia, in one or another way, supported fundamentalistic Islamic group, today they do understand that the future of the country depends on their ability uh, to fight against fundamentalism. So uh, there is no conflict between our possibility to coordinate our relation with Sunni countries and fight together with them against the uh, fundamentalistic group. By the way, including uh, Turkey, that is a brotherhood uh, Islamic country, but not a terrorist one. Uh, we had, I was ambassador in Turkey, and we coordinated our effort in fighting against a fundamentalistic group, Shia and Sunni, with a country that is Islamic Brotherhood. I don't have a good answer. <laughs> you don't have a good answer either. I will say the following. We are dealing with this crazy reality, working with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Qatar and uh, other uh, Sunni countries unofficially on the one hand, and realizing that there is this Wahhabi ideology that is also supported by many of them. We are dealing with this reality the same way the United States deals with this reality. We are no different. How do you explain the uh, United States ties with Saudi Arabia after 9-11? There is real politic. And the real politic uh, forces you sometimes to dance, a very delicate dance, to work for your interests, long-term interests, try to limit the threats that uh, are uh, in place uh, in very complicated uh, situations. It is a complicated situation. There is no black and white. You have to work for your interests prevent threats from developing and uh, increase your diplomatic and other ties uh, as necessary for your uh, well-being. The United States as a global power and Israel in our little mud, muddy place in the Middle East. Let's look at the next question. Yeah, go ahead. You both spoke about changing policy. In 1972, a Palestinian terrorist organization broke into the Olympic Village to attack Israeli athletes and ultimately kill them. If this event happened again today, um, say by a terrorist organization like Hamas or Hezbollah, what would be the Israeli response and would it differ from what it did back in 1972? There's no question. Whenever we will find ourselves a situation that the terrorist group is acting in a way they acted in uh, Munich against Israel, the answer will be the same maybe more serious as well. We are not going to permit any terrorist group to act against Israeli civilians in Israel or in other parts. The same, by the way, with the Iranian. No Israeli government will accept the situation in which a terrorist group here or abroad against Israel or against Jewish communities will, uh, will act in the world. We will know to answer and we are able to do it again. And uh, that is the principle, and uh, I agree with uh, Ambassador Avivi. What happened in 1972 in the Olympic uh, Village was, was dramatic. It was really dramatic. I don't know if you know what the Israeli response was. The Israeli response was at the time the Prime Minister was uh, Golda Meir, the, uh, at the time the first and so far the only woman Prime Minister that we had. She ordered the, the Mossad to go after everyone involved in the planning and the executing uh, of, uh, of that terror attack. 
and that is what uh, they did one after the other, wherever they were around the world. That is uh, an intelligence response. If, uh, if uh, that something that dramatic will happen, emanating from Hamas or Hezbollah, if that is something that dramatic, it will be much more clear and military, in my view. Which brings up memories of the attempted assassination in London of the Israeli ambassador, which helped fuel the Lebanon war, the first Lebanon war. Uh, any more questions, please? Yeah, go ahead. You brought up the deal of the century under the Trump administration. Uh, what do you believe that will look like, and do you believe that that will be done before the next election? It's a good question. Uh, President Trump was committed to this uh, big deal uh, from day one, after when he was elected, he developed it. But there is a political timetable. He wanted to actually make it public at the beginning of the year. And then he's called for elections. So he said, as the second, Let's wait with it. Let the Israelis elect its leadership once again, hopefully, in the eyes of Trump, of course. It's Netanyahu. I can continue working with Netanyahu after he wins the elections and make it public and move ahead. But something unexpected happened, and that is Netanyahu, uh, it is the miracles of Israeli politics, uh, which is he won the elections and couldn't form a government only in Israel. Um, so we have new elections going to take place in a, a few months. So do you come out uh, with it now or wait until after? I assume, we'll see, I assume it will have to wait. But if you wait, then the coming year is election year in the United States. And who comes out with such a major plan in the year of election, when you have no time to deal with it. You are dealing with one thing only, to be re-elected. So, and in the meantime, he came up with the economic section of the plan, which is not ex being accepted warmly. Uh, it's a British understatement. Uh, it is not uh, being accepted warmly, not by the Palestinians, not even by much of the Arab world. So it is, deep in cold water, this whole plan. Uh, it's very important to say that uh, the success of uh, the American program, in my personal opinion, doesn't uh, depend on the election. It depends on something much bigger. In order to have a peace agreement between two parties, you need two conditions to happen at the same time. You need a window of opportunity, a time in which it's possible to talk about peace, but at the same time, you need also, at the same time, precisely at the same time, to have a, a kind of leadership in both parties that is able to take a decision that will bring them to an agreement that will be far away from what the people expect them to, to find. But it will be the best agreement. I am very sorry to say that knowing what is the situation today between us and the Palestinians, I don't see seriously as uh, a uh, window of opportunities and they see less possibilities for the leadership in both sides to take such, such kind of uh, decisions. That's why people who want peace in Israel today and want to have an agreement are trying to think in a very different way, to think a little bit out of the box, to find the kind of solution that Palestinians will be able to live in Israel as well, that will be as bad as that good for both sides. But I don't think that the traditional program that today are on the table, two-state solution, simply saying like that, and coming back to 67 border from one side, or not giving any sentimental of the border, and staying with situations that it will bring us into a, a, a one country for both states, is possible. That's why people, and I think this group is one of them, trying to think out of the box, this is the answer. A program, American program, that is not able to go out of the box, will not have not the Israeli, not the Palestinian, and not the situation. I'm asking this question to gain a better understanding of the Israeli situation. Since you're a small country and you deal with a lot of threats, and uh, you have a lot to lose if you fall victim to those threats, what advice do you have for future political and military Israeli and American um, 
political and military leaders to to digest and navigate the Israeli situation? I am much better in explaining the past than advice about the future. <laughs> and I, I think that uh, both Israel and the United States are right about pointing and doing something about the threat of Iran. Iran is the most significant region, not only when it comes to Israel, but for much of the region and the countries in the region. And the pressure applied against Iran is in place, is right. It is only a question whether it will produce the result. So far, it hasn't. So far, it, or it was limited. Uh, so on that field, both Israel and the United States, uh, in my view, have to continue cooperating and continue, uh, continue working together both in highlighting the threat, because the threat is understood by the Americans and us, but not understood by, by many others. So that it, it, has, it has to be uh, clear, public, open. I understand on, on my way here, I heard on the radio that the Americans are going today, um, they are going to make public the evidence that they have that they are um, act against the four uh, tankers in the, uh, in the Gulf Sea. What was it? Two, three weeks ago, uh, they are going to uh, make the evidence, uh, uh, bring the evidence out that Iran was behind it. This is important. Um, militarily, I think the cooperation between Israel and uh, the United States is, is, is really incredible. It is going from strength to strength. Israel is not a, a part of NATO. So here we have uh, a different situation than a NATO state. By the way, Israel is not part of NATO for two reasons. One is uh, external to us. And that is, in order to become a member of NATO, you have to get consensus among NATO states for any new member to be accepted. That is not the case. As long as you have, for example, Turkey, a major a member of uh, NATO, uh, Turkey will not want to see Israel part of NATO. But the internal reason for which Israel is not part of NATO is uh, Israel is not willing to be part of NATO. It has advantages, but it has also disadvantages to be part uh, and limitations to be part. So at the moment, uh, the position is uh, that where we are today, not member of NATO, but extremely close ties with the United States, is producing the goods for both sides. So China is pursuing this One Belt, One Road initiative in order to build trade infrastructure in Central Asia and the Middle East. Uh, how is this going to influence Israel and also the countries around it in the future? Look, the world is changing. What we knew, the, uh, the world we knew in the past is, is not a, new, a world that we will see in the future. And the most dramatic change is China uh, global influence. Global influence which presents itself right now in economic terms. It is always being said that at the moment China has no motivation in military presence and that, uh, is not involved militarily in other conflict areas in the world, which is true. It defends very closely what is happening to, in, the, uh, in its immediate vicinity. But when it comes to more distant parts, China is avoiding in, uh, military involvement. Its spread of influence is through economic means, which serves its internal objective of improving the life of a heck of a lot of people. Uh, and secondly, it's uh, global influence. It will have, it already has, an effect on our region. By the way, much more on us than many of the Arab countries. Of course, the oil producing uh, countries like uh, Iran or Saudi Arabia, Iran not being Arab, but uh, an oil producer, uh, Iraq, and uh, Saudi, 
China is a major uh, buyer of uh, of oil, so it has a, 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 an importance from that point of view. For Israel, the importance is the fact that even though we are small, when it comes to technology, there is a major interest by China uh, for uh, our technology. Also, you know, economically, Israel, even though it is small, it is uh, quite significant. As, uh, so it is already playing a major role. It is going to grow. Anyone who thinks that uh, China is uh, going to step back from its ambitions, it will not happen. China's ambitions are very much there to stay. And that is why we see the growing concern in the United States, which presents itself in, uh, suggest, in uh, saying that this mobile company uh, has to be limited in, uh, in this, or that mobile company uh, cannot, uh, no civil servant or no government uh, official are, is allowed to buy from a certain <coughs> company. And that is why we are going to see more and more limitations because of the concern of the free trade and, and passage of know-how uh, to a, not only a potential enemy, but uh, a real enemy, which is not uh, an enemy in the sense of tomorrow going to war with, but it is about hegemony, power, influence, and economy. We are very much in it. We have to play very carefully. As I said, we are very attentive to not seeing deep Chinese uh, presence in sensitive areas in Israel. And we are also very attentive to American concerns about Israeli technology, sensitive technology, going to, to China only for a buck. You know, sometimes you have to uh, avoid uh, making a good deal in the short run in order to protect your interest in the long run. Israel, the United States, the world understands that the Chinese, in a very intelligent way, understood that in order to become the superpower of the world, they don't need a military power. They need an economic power, and uh, including, at the same time, uh, what we call the, uh, the world of cyber, to be the first one in cyber. And they are now buying everything that they can uh, build in the world, in order to become a super economic power. I'll give you one example. I could give you 10, but I'll give you one example. They built in the last uh, years two pipelines between Central Asian countries and Ch China that can bring every year 40 B uh, BCM uh, a, a year, 40 billion cubic meter of gas between uh, uh, Central Asian countries and China. What does it mean? It means that less uh, energy is coming to Russia, less energy is coming to Europe, less energy is coming to the Middle East, and they are becoming stronger and stronger. They are buying today energy not for tomorrow, but for the next uh, 40 years. And uh, as you heard in the last weeks, uh, in the Huawei, on the telephone, they are doing everything in their hand to become a superpower in cyber as well. It is not uh, in an answer to your question, but I think it is appropriate for me at least to end with, <coughs> with that. Look, we talked about cyber technology and, center, uh, and, and influence. Uh, we had elections in Israel, and we are going to have new elections. And the question of how we as democracies protect ourselves in this very sensitive, most dramatic, most important manifestation of democracy, which is elections. Uh, when we, we the people, elect our leaders from external, how we protect ourselves from external influence, was evident in, uh, in the last elections in Israel, will be evident in the next elections. The cyber protection of our, our election process very little we know about, but we know that uh, it is a priority uh, of the regulators to try and see how we limit foreign influence. You, and you saw it in the last elections in the United States. You, know, you don't need armies.
to influence another country, to even bring it down. It is enough to use technology. If you can have an effect on who is the leader and what policy that leader will have vis-a-vis -vis -vis you, you achieved your goal without shooting one bullet, one rocket. I'm not even talking about cyber warfare against uh, strategic installations. That's, that's two steps up. But even on this very basis of our societies, which is democracy, freely choosing our leaders, this is the world of the future. And we have a lot of work to, ahead of us, both you and us, in making sure that we are not allowing foreign involvement. By the way, foreign involvement uh, cannot only be in order to elect one and not the other. Foreign involvement in elections can be actually just to bring chaos to the system. And that is maybe even more dangerous because to bring chaos to the system, normally the average citizen is not even aware that he is a victim of such an attempt. This is the danger of democracies. We have no uh, democracy, you know, is uh, our joint system that we chose in the absence of any other. It's not the best system, but it's better than all the other systems. But now it is under threat that we have to protect it. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.